As the end of this wicked system approaches, we personally will be faced with the situation, what will you do in the face of Satan's attack? Brother H. Poloyan of the Brooklyn Bethel family will help us to reason on this topic. What will you do in the face of Satan's attack? Brother Poloyan. In most places, crime is a constant threat to our security. Because of this, we do whatever we can to avoid being the victim of a criminal. We try to avoid walking along dark streets by ourselves. We stay away from places where unruly persons hang out. We try to protect our homes as best we can with locks. We take these precautions because we don't want to lose property or be hurt or perhaps even lose our lives to criminal elements. Yet the worst criminal in all universal history is out to do us much greater harm if he can. He's not just satisfied with seeing us mugged for our money, or having our homes broken into, or inflicting pain on us, or even killing us. This foul criminal is after far more. He's after our eternal life, and he'll do everything he can to interfere with that. Since he knows that eternal life comes only from obeying Jehovah, he works to get God's people to disobey Jehovah. Yes, Satan the devil, the most debased criminal of all times, is out to get us. He's out to destroy our relationship with Jehovah. But we're not going to let him do that, are we, brothers? Yet, if we take precautions in our daily living because of the threat posed by ordinary criminals, should we not take even greater precautions against Satan since he's far more dangerous? What makes the need for this precaution even greater is that our enemy is invisible. But we know that he's nevertheless very real. We know that storm winds are invisible, but look at the destruction they can cause. So too with Satan. Invisible, true, but highly dangerous and destructive. And Satan, having once been in the truth, knows a greater variety of attack methods than the average criminal. But whatever the method, his goal is to break our integrity to Jehovah. Remember, he even offered Jesus vast benefits for just one act of disobedience to Jehovah. However, our God knows exactly what Satan's methods are. And Jehovah takes care of his people by pointing out those methods and what we can do to protect ourselves. That's why the Apostle Paul could say of Satan at 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not ignorant of his designs. Very often, Satan has employed the frontal attack, that is, persecution that includes violence or imprisonment. This was used against Jesus and the Apostles. And who can forget the vicious treatment of our brothers and sisters from Malawi in recent years? We do not know how many of us will yet undergo violent persecution, but we do know that it could come to us individually. Jesus said of our time at Matthew 24, 9, Then people will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you and you will be objects of hatred by all the nations on account of my name. Why does Satan so often use physical violence? Because he tries to take advantage of the fact that Jehovah created us with the desire to avoid pain and suffering. No normal human wants that. 
In fact, we go to great lengths to avoid it, don't we? If we have an ache or a pain, we try to take some medicine or treatment to remedy it. So Satan figures that if we do whatever we can to avoid a little pain, then if he can cause us great pain, maybe we'll take any step to avoid that. He's hoping we'll take the ultimate step, that of compromising our faith in Jehovah. Being a snake in the grass, a deceptive, underhanded criminal, Satan sees that often a frontal attack doesn't work. So he tries to use other means, deception, crafty acts. As 2 Corinthians 11:14 says, Satan himself keeps transforming himself into an angel of light. But these deceptive tactics aren't new either. He started using them with Adam and Eve way back in the Garden of Eden. And what he used wasn't something that would seem bad or undesirable in itself. He didn't tell Adam and Eve to just deny Jehovah or to commit suicide outright. Instead, Satan used something that could be thought of as pleasurable to get them to disobey Jehovah. Eating of the trees of the garden had already brought them pleasure. They no doubt enjoyed the taste of the fruit, enjoyed looking at it, maybe even enjoyed the feel of it. So one after the other, the trees proved pleasurable and beneficial. Well then, why not that tree over there? After all, the others are nice, aren't they? Why, look at that beautiful fruit. Mm, it does look appetizing. And you know, it's not only delicious, but it'll improve your thinking. Why, you'll be like gods if you'll just eat it. And certainly, it could never hurt you. You know the rest. It did hurt. And it not only hurt them, it hurt us. It hurt everybody. Sin and death, pain and sorrow are direct results of our first parents thinking that something pleasurable wouldn't hurt them after Jehovah had already told them that it would. Included among these crafty acts of Satan is one that can be very, very trying, especially to a person new in the truth. This is where Satan uses the fear of man against us. This may include neighbors, friends, or relatives. It may even be one's husband or wife. They may work against our being in the truth in many ways, perhaps outrightly condemning our association with Jehovah's people and trying to prevent it. They may insult us, suggesting that there's something wrong with us, for letting God's truths have such an influence on our lives. But there's nothing wrong with us because we love the truth. There's something wrong with them for not loving the truth. It's not an easy thing to see people you know turn away from you or against you because of your faith in Jehovah. It's surely very heart-wrenching when this turns out to be someone you love. But it could happen, and we should be prepared for it if it does. For Jesus said at Matthew 10, 36, Indeed, a man's enemies will be persons of his own household. Another avenue that Satan craftily exploits is our desire for material things. Wanting sufficient material items to make our lives comfortable and enjoyable is normal and proper. But Satan tries to get us so sidetracked in pursuing them that we have to let go of something else, and he hopes what we let go of is our relationship to Jehovah. In this area, there are many things that could be enjoyable and not improper in themselves, but that could seduce us if carried too far. One such is sports. Men especially from their youth up are attracted to sports events. 
Here the servant of Jehovah must be very careful that this form of recreation doesn't become unbalanced. But how do you know when it is? Well, if it takes away from your attendance at Christian meetings or serving Jehovah in the field ministry at the times you've set aside for it, or if it encroaches on your time for studying God's word at home or your family responsibilities, then you know you're already in a danger area. Some of you brothers who enjoy sports, can you reel off statistics on ball players such as who's hit the most home runs or who has the highest batting average in baseball? Do you know what the quarterback situation is with the Dallas Cowboys this year? Do you know who won the NBA playoffs this year and who was voted the most valuable player in them? Do you know what horse won the Triple Crown recently and what kind of records he set in doing it? Now, most of you sisters have little idea what I'm even talking about in these events. Sisters generally don't have an active interest in sports. But some of you brothers, you know you could probably answer most, if not all, of those questions. Is this to say that taking some interest in sports as recreation is wrong? Well, no more so than watching television or doing a number of things you may get pleasure out of for recreation. But what if we know more about sports and people in sports than we do about Jehovah, his purpose, the lives of faithful men of Bible times? Would this not indicate an imbalance in our lives? Would it not be good then to exercise caution in this area so as not to let anything, however enjoyable, interfere with our main concern in life? No doubt some of you sisters may now be inclined to tell your menfolk as soon as you get a chance, uh, if you haven't nudged them with your elbow already. You may say to them, see, what did I tell you? I told you not to watch those old ball games. But sisters, what about the time you spend shopping when you don't really need something? Or looking at women's magazines? Or sewing more dresses than you really need? Or spending time talking about such things? The point being made here is not that all these things are evil in themselves, but they could be if we go to the extreme, if we let them get in our way of worshiping Jehovah. So, in these areas, it's really a matter of keeping things balanced, isn't it? Another area that Satan finds fruitful has to do with the fact that we observe others making mistakes. And this can upset us, especially when the person making the mistake is an elder or a ministerial servant. Yet, does the Bible say that we're all imperfect except elders and ministerial servants? No, they're going to make their share of mistakes too. But rather than blow out of proportion the mistakes that we all make, why not concentrate on the good that's being done? Think of the fine qualities that Jehovah's people have. Our love of righteous principles allows us to have an earthwide unity that the world can't even dream of. Jehovah's people enjoy a practically crime-free society because of our love of God and man. We have the highest moral standards, the most honest people to associate with. We have genuine peace and contentment while the world is going mad. We have spiritual prosperity while other religions disintegrate. And we have the grandest possible hope for the future drawing very near. Brothers, aren't we all grateful to Jehovah for such marvelous blessings? <laughs> then if we keep counting these blessings and avoid dwelling on the relatively insignificant mistakes that we all make, we won't get so upset over them. And instead of expecting 100% from our brothers, we should be satisfied with much less because we're 6,000 years removed from human perfection. Don't expect of your brothers and sisters what Jehovah doesn't expect of them at this time. 
That is perfection. Think about it. Could you rightly expect of others what you can't produce yourself? Perfection? Also, keep in mind what's stated at Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. It says, If errors were what you watch, O, Jah, o Jehovah, who could stand? For there is the true forgiveness with you. Well, now, aren't we happy that our merciful, loving God, Jehovah, forgives our mistakes? Then we should forgive others in return and not allow room for Satan's mischief. Of all the crafty means that Satan uses to try to break a person's integrity to Jehovah, sexual immorality is second to none. You know, the majority of those who've been disfellowshipped from Jehovah's organization have committed some kind of sexual immorality. Paul at 1 Corinthians 10.8 shows that because of this, 23,000 Israelites fell in one day. Think of that. Satan seems to take some kind of perverted glee at using something clean and honorable that Jehovah has given to man to work against man's best interest. He tries to make it seem that forbidden sexual fruit is somehow more attractive than honorable marriage. But it is not. It produces rotten fruit. It produces trouble, family breakups, damaged consciences, possible venereal disease and unwanted pregnancies and disgrace. Since the fruits of immorality are so rotten, it has to be a rotten tree. And for a person in the truth, it can produce the rottenest fruit of all. It can get him disfellowship from Jehovah's organization. But to lose Jehovah's favor, especially now, so near the end of this system of things, may mean to lose life forever. What a fantastically heavy price to pay for being caught off guard by Satan's crafty methods. It's surely not worth it. Thus, Thus we can see how vital it is to defend ourselves against Satan's various attacks. In defending ourselves against Satan, there are several essential things to keep in mind. One is that our defense is not a physical one. Ephesians 6.12 says, We have a wrestling not against blood and flesh, but against the governments, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness against the wicked spirit forces in heavenly places. Since it's a spiritual fight, we need spiritual strength. And this means building up a hard appreciation of God and his purposes. Another all-important essential is to understand why God permits Satan's attack. He permits it because one of the issues Satan has raised is that humans can't do what's right without being bribed. So permitting Satan's attack tests the loyalty of Christians. And in this way, those not serving Jehovah out of love for him are sifted out. As Jesus said, Satan has demanded to have you men to sift you as wheat. Also, it's important to always keep in mind where the attacks come from. Indeed, sin and death, sorrow and pain, as well as persecution, originated with Satan. So if we feel frustrated or even mad at having such troubles, we should direct our animosity where it belongs, against Satan, not against Jehovah. Satan is the cause. Our hatred should be directed against him and his foul system of things. We should feel as did a five-year-old Texas sister. She said bluntly in her nice Texas drawl concerning Satan the devil, she said, 
I hate Satan's guts. Well, we may not put it quite that bluntly, but that's the way we feel about it, isn't it? So while Jehovah allows persecution, he sustains us with his powerful Holy Spirit if we do our part. And that's another essential to remember, is that our integrity to Jehovah doesn't have any automatic, uh, what we might call, breaking point. If we do our part, Jehovah will do his. If we go as far as our imperfect human flesh will carry us, Jehovah's promise to take us the rest of the way. Psalm 55, 22 says, Throw your burden upon Jehovah himself, and he himself will sustain you. Never, think of that, never will he allow the righteous one to totter. The proof of this, is that our faithful brothers have experienced all kinds of horrible persecution in ancient times and in modern times, and they have not compromised. This shows that Jehovah's Spirit is far more powerful than any device that men or wicked spirits can use against us. Let's listen now to two sisters who are discussing this very same point. We'll see how the experiences of Jehovah's servants in our day testify to his help in time of need. You know, Betty, when I see what some of our brothers and sisters have gone through, I sometimes wonder if I can take persecution. I guess the thing that really frightens me the most is the thought of undergoing physical violence and pain. I can understand that, Rose, and especially us being women. We don't like the idea of being physically attacked. Yet I often think of how Jehovah helped his his people in these situations. For example, Do you remember what happened a few years ago in the United Arab Republic? No, I don't think I remember. What happened there? Well, violent persecution broke out in that country. The brothers had their property taken away. They lost their jobs, were arrested, and savagely beaten. At a police station, one of the brothers was undressed, His mouth and eyes were covered, his feet and hands tied, and he was forced to lie down on his stomach. Then he was beaten unmercifully with a leather belt. This same brutal treatment was given to a 64-year-old brother, even though he suffered from a serious illness that caused his hand to tremble all the time. Oh, that's just awful. In Cairo, another brother was beaten for three hours because he refused to sign a statement that he would discontinue being a witness for Jehovah. He was given a few hours to think the matter over and was again taken in and beaten almost continuously for six more hours. One of the other brothers suffered such a terrible beating that it caused another prisoner who was just watching to faint. Well, did those brothers compromise their faith? No, they didn't. Those brothers explained in what a wonderful way they were strengthened and comforted by Jehovah. One of them said, while I was lying on the ground being beaten, I was praying to Jehovah to help me to endure this torture. I was very happy because Jehovah, the Almighty God, did help me. Another brother said, regardless of the amount of insulting and beatings that we received, a few seconds would pass and we would not feel anything more even though the beatings continued. We were feeling that Jehovah God was always with us. That surely proves that Jehovah is with those that trust him, doesn't it? Yes. And in these cases, even the severe pain of the beatings 
was softened, making it possible to endure, while even the camp officials and others were amazed. In fact, one of them told a witness this. He said, I am very happy to know persons who remind me of the early Christians and who are ready to endure all persecution for the sake of the faith. I will teach my children that in the concentration camp there were true Christians in the full sense of the word and that these are Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Betty, that helps me to appreciate that no matter what we go through, if we do our part, Jehovah will help us in wonderful ways. He certainly will, Rose, because that's what he's promised. And you know, Jehovah always keeps his promise. Thank you, sisters. It's surely a privilege to be associated with such faithful brothers, isn't it? Those faithful brothers undergoing that kind of persecution appreciated fully that it was not by their own strength that they were able to endure. They knew that it was mainly by the strength that comes from Jehovah. As Zechariah 4, 6 shows, it is not by military force nor by power, but by my spirit, Jehovah of armies has said. However, we shouldn't expect God's Spirit to be with us if we're not doing His will. If we're doing things out of harmony with Christian principles, we can't rightly expect Him to help us out of trouble that may come upon us. For example, if a person drinks too much in the way of alcoholic beverages, then climbs into his car and sees he's having trouble driving, can he rightly pray to Jehovah to help him think clearly so he can drive properly? If a person searches out the company of the opposite sex and allows himself to get into a compromising situation, then commits immorality, can he say to Jehovah, why didn't you protect me? When Jehovah tells us to dress modestly, but we insist on wearing suggestive, revealing clothing, can we rightly ask Jehovah not to lead us into temptation? When the Bible tells us to train our children in the discipline and mental regulating of Jehovah, but we don't, can we rightly pray to Jehovah to help us with our children? If we think more about money than we should and go to a greater extent than is needed to provide our daily requirements, can we expect Jehovah to protect us from materialism? In all of such things, to expect Jehovah's help when we have gone against his will is like deliberately jumping off a cliff and then wondering why we're falling. No, we can't expect Jehovah's Spirit to help us if we are not doing what he wants us to do. So then, our objective should be to see how far we can keep away from the temptations that Satan puts in front of us, not how close we can get to them and still stay in the truth. We should close off any opening that Satan could use for entry. As Paul said in Ephesians 4.27, neither allow place for the devil. A good principle to follow in avoiding temptation is not to take the first step that could lead to it. When an alcoholic was asked which drink caused him the most trouble, he said, the first. That first drink lowered his guard just enough to make it easier to take the second, which made it easier to take the third, which led to drunkenness. So in many areas of life, it's much better not to take that first step. What all of these things show is that Satan indeed has a variety of ways to attack Jehovah's servants, so we need to take many precautions. In fact, as Ephesians 6.13 says, we need to take up the complete suit of armor from God that we may be able to resist in the wicked day. Paul used this illustration of armor carried by a Roman soldier. That armor had to be complete. For example, how long would he have lasted in combat if he was missing his sword or shield or helmet? So too, we need a complete suit of armor. 
that Roman soldier went to any trouble he needed to put on that whole suit. Well, with everlasting life at stake, we should be even more willing to make any extra effort required. Another thing, that Roman soldier may have had all his equipment on, but he knew that more was required. He had to practice to become skilled as a soldier. If a runner wants to win a race, what does he have to do? He has to practice, practice, practice. We're like soldiers in combat like runners seeking a prize. So we need to constantly, every day, practice the Christian way of life until it becomes almost second nature to us, like a habit. You know, you don't build physical strength by having somebody else do your exercise for you. You've got to do it yourself. You don't build spiritual strength just by watching other people practice Bible principles. You have to do it yourself every day of your life. Very soon, during the Great Tribulation, Satan will unleash his final all-out attack against Jehovah's people, and it'll be the greatest test of our faith yet. With that event coming on <clears throat> very swiftly, we need to do everything in our power to equip ourselves for survival. And as we do, Keep in mind that Satan has no secret weapon. What he's going to do to us in the future is what he's already done to God's people in the past. So now we have time yet to learn about these things and make up our minds in advance how we'll meet each one of them. And also we yet have time to draw closer and closer to Jehovah in prayer, learning to rely more and more on him in all things. If we do this, in our daily lives now, we can have confidence that we're preparing ourselves well for the main bout soon to come. Then we'll be able to say, as Paul did in Romans chapter 8, if God is for us, who will be against us? Who will separate us from the love of the Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution, or hunger, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. To the contrary, in all these things, Paul says, we are coming off completely victorious through him that loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor governments, nor things here, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation will be able to separate us from God's love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.